All right. Hello, everyone. I see we still have some folks logging in, but I just want to make sure we, we kick it off and make the most of this, this special time we have together with the wonderful Ann Baum. Um, my name is Megan Simmons, and I uh, work for ISKME, the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management and Education. We, uh, you may know us uh, from our, one of our projects is the digital library um, and collaborative platform OER Commons. And I lead our training and design program. So within uh, the work that we do at ISKME, um, we have research, we have uh, technology uh, development that we do, and we also uh, do trainings and workshops and events to really support uh, educators like yourselves in collaborating and sharing and improving uh, what you do. So uh, this webinar series is actually uh, an ongoing offering that we have um, for um, our community and hopefully we have some new folks joining us. It's, it's great to see that we have um, folks from Maryland, Pennsylvania, Iowa um, on the call so far and look forward to uh, seeing more. And um, yeah, the intention really with this webinar series is to showcase some of the great work and wonderful leaders that we're seeing in statewide implementation of OER and really to connect folks because so many states uh, and colleges and universities are getting started with their OER initiatives or maybe even just thinking about it. And we've really noticed the benefits of connecting folks with people that have tackled some of the similar challenges that come up for people when they're thinking of doing really uh, large shifts in, in practice in terms of adopting and implementing OER. And um, so this is our third series in the storytelling series where we've invited uh, different perspectives from statewide OER implementation to share their stories, really you know, how they started with OER and um, the different steps they've made along the way and what they've learned and uh, really open it up for discussion for uh, you all to hopefully reap some of the benefits of, of the good, the bad, and the ugly of, of rolling out statewide work. <laughs> I see Anne nodding already. Um, so, yeah, and I think um, t today's speaker, Anne Baum, is just uh, a real inspiration for our team, somebody that we turn to a lot, um, who's just done really remarkable work with pretty much a, a group of volunteers um, to, to get this really rolling. And when I first uh, heard about Anne and her work, I just, I actually, well, I had seen that they had been doing some work um, in, their, in their hub. And then I just saw all this activity on Twitter where they were doing all these uh, trainings throughout the state. And I just said, who, who is this Anne Baum and what, <laughs> what's going on in Pennsylvania? This is fantastic. And um, it's just been great to hear, learn more about her journey and, and the great work that they're doing. So, um, and I think her story is really uh, interesting because their OER project really came out of um, a, a faculty meeting, a team meeting where they um, were just kind of talking about new ideas and this came up and uh, people decided to do it. And there's just been a real uh, motivation and enthusiasm from, from her team um, to get this rolling and they've been really effective and she's actually conducting a training today so we get her for this precious hour <laughs> and then she has to go back in and 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 work with educators so we're we're really grateful to have her and Anne is the supervisor of education technology at uh, Lincoln Intermediate Unit 12 uh, the Lincoln Intermediate units are one of uh, 29 independent or uh, sorry intermediate units I get so tongue-tied with all the different <laughs> service agencies in the different states but this is one of uh, 29 uh, in intermediate units uh, in Pennsylvania and um, they are the education service agencies in the state uh, that um, are providing a lot of great supports to to schools throughout the state and Anne is the project lead for uh, the PAIU hub, um, along with a project team representing eight of the intermediate units in her state. And her team has worked to implement OER across the state 
through the development of Im an implementation stage of professional learning needed to really get this ball rolling. So we're going to hear a lot of um, great information about what that has looked like from, from inception of this idea in this great uh, faculty meeting where people were inspired to really getting on the ground and, and getting out to all these different uh, intermediate units to, to do the work. So uh, thank you so much, Anne, for being with us today. And um, I'll hand it over to you and uh, let you uh, tell your story. And in the meantime, if, if folks have um, any um, questions or comments, let's, let's use the chat for now um, so we can kind of limit some feedback, uh, hopefully. <laughs> and then at the end, uh, we look forward to uh, having a rich discussion and addressing some of your questions and comments that come up. So that's the plan for today. And I will hand it to Anne to, uh, to kick it off. Thanks so much for being here, Anne. You're welcome. Thank you, Megan. And thanks for joining, um, asking PA to join um, you in this series. Um, we've, we've done a lot of work together with different members of ISCME, um, and uh, you guys have really helped us um, get to where we need to be. And there's been a lot of work back and forth. So we appreciate you uh, taking the time to include us in your series. Um, again, I'm Ann Baum. Um, you have my information there on the slide. And uh, I'm going to jump right in and tell you a little bit about Pennsylvania, in case you're not familiar with our system. We do have intermediate units. Um, we have 29. And they are education service agencies. We serve, um, you know, districts in our community. Um, we do a lot more than just um, a lot of people associate us with special ed, but we have a lot of areas that we work with from technology to business services to management services. Um, and we do a lot of our work now that goes beyond our regions and our state and many uh, IUs do work now uh, nationally or even internationally, we have some, some programs. So um, we're intermediate units. Many of you have heard of uh, BOCES or uh, ESAs or ESCs. So we're pretty much the equivalent of that. So every state has, a different title there, and that's ours. Um, so um, I didn't put the lines of our intermediate units, but we have some that cover an entire county, and then others like mine, we have three counties in the south central part of Pennsylvania. Um, so it really depends on um, each IU, kind of how you're working with your schools. Overall, we have 500 districts in our state. To give you an example, in my region, three counties, we have 25 public schools, two career and tech schools, and then about 80 plus non-public schools that we work with. Um, so pretty big area, but um, we know uh, statewide, many of you are joining us from the statewide level, you have something similar, um, either through your education service agencies or if you're countywide, you have a little bit of a different program. Speaking of countywide, in Pennsylvania, we have local control. So um, it's interesting, you know, try to get 500 districts to do something all together. That's a really big challenge because we have sh a struggle of just getting 29 intermediate units to decide on one thing and do it together. So this has been a really exciting opportunity because it has crossed multiple job alike uh, groups at the state level. So for example, and I know some of the project team is on here as well, many of us attend um, a group called PAMES and we represent the ed tech side of things. And then there's a job alike for curriculum, special ed, business managers and so forth. So um, we meet together to do that and we often come together and have great ideas, um, but we often go back to our own IUs and keep doing our work. And then there are other times that we come together and we come up with some great ideas and we keep doing that work. And this is really example, an example of that. Um, and it's, it's exciting that we were able to get the whole state to buy in. So this is our hub and we chose this most recent picture. Megan, I don't know if you noticed, we changed our picture. Um, but we used to have a state capital because we just couldn't find something we were happy with. And so we launched in October, um, and jumping ahead a little bit, but just to let you know, um, we recently changed this and we really liked it because we are a grassroots program. Um, so we really, um, we started 
at, it wasn't a faculty meeting, but an open space. So in our state meetings, part of our meetings are held in an open space format. I'm not sure how familiar everyone is that, that format. It's very similar to kind of an unconference feel. And we, you know, put on the spreadsheet topics that we want to talk about and share across our IUs. And um, in January of last year, um, we had put OER on, on the list. And so a group of us came together. It was a small group. You get to choose which open space topic you want to be at. And we just started talking about um, OER and that we all were in the, many of us were in the same place of we wanted to offer professional learning, but none of us had done the work. Now there were a few IUs who had done something the previous year with their districts. So they had some knowledge so we could use and uh, tap into that knowledge. Um, but we hadn't developed um, a collaborative professional learning plan. So we decided, hey, rather than each of our IUs going back and designing our own OER workshop or training, why don't we do this all together? It just makes sense. And like I said, um, sometimes it's hard to bring an entire state together on a training. And we talk about it all the time. Um, why do we all come together, but then we all go back and uh, create the same Google training or the same whatever training, and we don't always collaborate on creating that. Um, and time is always a factor. But we decided, hey, we're on the same boat sort of with OER, so um, let's try to do this together. And um, so that's our picture. We have the, the, you know, from the ground up, grassroots, it's been a hilly process. We're gonna share some of our, our uh, challenges as well as our successes. Um, there with you. So I'm going to um, tell this story very much in the order of the before, during, after. And I always talk about the BDA process, reading strategies. I like to talk about that and relate it to digital content. Um, so an example is in Edpuzzle, um, we talk about, well, it's great that if you found a great video, but the importance of providing the B and the A in addition to the questions in between for the during. So we say how valuable it is for the teacher to set the stage or maybe preview in the before stage and then in the after, you know, have debrief or summarize. And so we talk about that BDA process as existing for reading, but digital content is also a literacy as well. So we make that connection. And so we decided um, to share out with everyone we would use um, this model for this. So we're going to talk about our before, during, and after or what's coming up next with our implementation. And again, I just put a picture here of open space with the rules. That's how we really began. Um, and just to tell you, most often those open spaces, it's just we do it that day and we move back, we keep moving on. But that day, the open space became um, you know, we kept meeting and it became a subcommittee and now we have a project team um, and now we're running like today a statewide training. So it's amazing how a small group of people could come together with a very informal topic and really come together to make it uh, come to fruition. Um, really important for us as part of this process was to develop the professional learning with this. Um, so um, the group was coming together not only to talk about how we could implement OER and what space we could use to curate and evaluate, but also the importance of the professional learning with this. Um, this isn't something you can just throw to a district and say, go ahead, start. <laughs> um, it really does require professional learning. So we built a four-part learning series, um, and here you're seeing the three. So the first session was an overview to help our district teams gain buy-in, have an understanding of OER and why they should wanna continue this. So it was a different professional learning model for us. We, we um, offered it as a four-part series. The first part was more district leadership um, centered. Um, we gave each district up to 10 seats to attend. We encouraged them to bring superintendent, assistant superintendent, um, principals, their tech director, their instructional technology coach, or whatever version they have of that, as well as um, some lead teachers. So that was day one. We really set the stage. 
Um, we had a district, we had them do district planning. We had a lot of cross district collaboration, which is really important for us in our area and our role with our districts. Um, so that was a really important day to lay the foundation and set up for success for the remaining three days. And then what we did is each district had those 10 seats, but they could change who came to the next day's training. And we did this over several months. Um, so day two was more about curation and evaluation. So we said, you still want some sort of administrative um, presence so you can continue your vision and mission that, and the plan that we worked on in day one. Um, but now we're gonna do a lot more curating and evaluating. So you probably want some more teachers on board. So it was nice that we created some flexibility in the seats that the districts um, had chosen. So day one, again, high administrative level, day two, some administration, but a lot more teachers for really for the next three, um, I'd say we had that. So that just gives you um, a little glimpse, kind of very brief overview what we were doing at the curate and evaluate level, the instruct level, and then the assess, reflect, showcase. Now we um, did this based on the achieve process. So we examined, you know, go open, achieve. We looked at some other um, frameworks and they all have similar verbiage there. Um, but we liked what achieve said with, okay, well, let's curate and evaluate, then instruct and then assess and reflect and then repeat. And we felt that was really important for the OER process and um, the cycle we want our districts to continue after the professional learning that they do with us. So we use that as our structure and framework then for the remaining three days. Um, a really neat um, activity that ended on day four was the lesson showcase. So during the instruct phase, we had teachers cross district start authoring lessons and then they did some peer review and then they did sort of like um, a poster session at a conference. They set up, you know, either their computer, some people brought some other materials, and they just shared what they had done. Um, that was an accountability piece we built in. Not of all of our districts made it the whole way to the end, but it was interesting to hear the feedback from participants. They were saying how valuable it was to finally just kind of see what everyone had taken and developed and how they had implemented. Most of them implemented it right into their classroom. So um, they could come back and reflect on that process, what could be changed, uh, what could be updated. And then we evaluated those lessons uh, when they came back after the showcase. And um, we continued to do some activities in the area of assessing the whole process, the district process, um, and continuing the process back in the district, as well as how do we continue this in our region? What do we do as next steps to keep coming together to do curation and evaluation? And that's more in the after, so I'll hold off a little bit with that. Um, so just a few uh, pictures. We spent a lot of time training our state leaders. So um, I have the project team, as mentioned earlier, there's um, nine of us total uh, representing eight IUs. And um, we've kind of been on the ground uh, just creating as much of the work as possible um, to make everyone else successful. So this uh, training here happened to be, we had two trainings um, this past year. We had one for all the OER point of contact. So, Every intermediate unit was asked to assign someone to be a point of contact for OER so we could push out announcements to that group, but then train that group first and foremost. So we did that. And this is actually the second training we did. Um, we offered it, okay, now we did the point of contacts. If you have other people in your uh, region, your intermediate unit who should also be trainers or will be the actual trainer in your IU, send them to us. So this is a picture of that. So we trained, um, this day we had almost 40 people, plus we had trained the point of contacts earlier. So imagine now we have 29 IUs, we have at least um, you know, one to two people in every region who has the ability to train and offer the four day training session. This session, um, we also, the morning was a lot of the overview of five R's, um, you know, OER, how to um, author within OER Commons, our hub and everything. And then 
um, we gave them access to all of our training materials so they could start digging into those. And what was really important for our process, and I didn't mention this earlier, is we're all local control, meaning even our IUs were all different. So it was important that our training materials were adaptable and flexible so an IU could take the materials and make it work for them. So that was this session, the afternoon, they were able to do the work, make copies of all of our stuff and design it for your own uh, region. And that's been really important. Like my IU, we did all four days. Other IUs are saying our districts aren't going to go for that. So they're doing a two or three day program. And we've built that into this to make sure every IU can make it their own because every IU in our state is different. We have different focus areas, um, we have different capacity levels. And so um, we just made sure there was training for all of those areas and we just made sure that everyone could take what they found and make it their own. And really in the spirit of OER, that's what it's all about. So um, we built that in our, in our work as well. This is just a quick example of that lesson showcase um, actually at our IU. And I just love this picture because everyone is so excited to see what they had created, what they had authored and what they were sharing back to our region and beyond um, in our PA hub and of course in the bigger OER Commons community. And I love how one of the teachers is actually recording another teacher to capture what he was saying and just how everyone was so engaged in that process. And Megan, feel free to stop me. I'm, I can't see all the questions and things or if you need me to slow down or anything, just let me know. You're doing um, great, Anne. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, like I said, a year ago is a little uh, over a year ago is when the idea started in an open space. Our um, PAIU OER hub launched in October so we could start training state, statewide level of people. And then we did our official launch because we hadn't really shared it with the districts as a whole. Um, we didn't push any statewide, hey, look what we've done. Um, we didn't. We didn't do that yet. So we used PNC, which is our state conference, to really be kind of an official launch, like, hey, this is here, things are happening, trainings are happening. Um, so um, on the left, you can see we had a little card produced for um, handing out. We have our own booth there, but we also presented twice. Um, we presented from the announcement of the hub, and then we also presented from the professional learning standpoint, um, what is needed, what do you need to know um, with OER. So that was great for us to have that much presence. Um, and just between, so that was October, and then PNC was in February. So the 27 original groups, we created a group for every IU, and we're now up to 63 groups um, from October. So we're pretty pleased with that. And we have over 560 users in that short amount of time. So sometimes as our project team, we need to stop and reflect and say, we just kicked this off in October. So we should be proud of, of what we've done in that amount, that amount of time. I just put this here. Um, this was, we just received our feedback from our state conference. It takes a, a few months and then we get that. And so it was good timing. So I added this here, but I just thought I'd add this so you could see um, just the power of just a presentation at our state conference, how it's influencing our districts already. So I'll let you read that. I'm not going to read that to you. Um, some other things we heard, um, the librarians and media specialists uh, were so excited. They're like, it's about time, right? So they um, said, thanks for presenting this. Um, the future of free library resources, they were so excited. People were saying they were it was so helpful, it was so thoughtful. And again, um, hearing things like, I didn't even know what OER meant. So we were really meeting our goal of educating people um, more. And even though they were short one hour conference presentations, it was a good way to kick things off and make more people aware of it. And then at that conference, we really emphasized that each IU will be able to provide you professional learning in this area. So they could go back to their IU and say, hey, I'm inter interested in this. How can you help us in this area? So that was a great um, forum to get things up and running. 
So that all sounds great, right? Beautiful. <laughs> um, but I think it's important to stop and say, okay, what were our roadblocks? What were our challenges? And we've, we've had a good many. Um, as Megan said, we are a volunteer group. Um, so I, everyone's education service agencies have a different um, mod, business model on things. But um, in our areas, many of us um, you know, offer our professional learning ser services for fee services. Um, so that part was where revenue could come in for this. But in order to actually uh, design, implement, and get this project rolling, it really was this project team, again, that started from an open space one day, um, who really have been working so hard and for volunteer time um, to get things running. So that in itself has been a challenge. Um, but I, I, this slide, we were putting it together as a group and I just love this. So you see this guy questioning. The biggest question we get is, where are the PA standards? Hands down, I hear it at every training. Well, the PA standards aren't in here yet, right? So Common Core is in OER Commons, NGSS, and then a few states, there's some ASL in there. Um, but um, we didn't purchase to get our standards added yet. We are in the process, however, um, and today we're working with our STEM points of contact across the state. So they're very anxious. They want science and engineering in there. And then we just, um, if we didn't adopt, I wanna use the right word, we endorsed, I think, uh, the CSTA standards. Um, so trying to figure out how we can get all of that added to make it easier for us. Um, at the moment, I mean, I was just literally working with a group of um, IU colleagues and we're aligning resources and just using our standard coding system as a tag right now in the system. And even that has caused some challenges, how we do that. And I was telling Megan early on, we have um, just science and technology and engineering we have 2002 standards that are being tested. We have 2009 standards that exist and are on our main SAS portal. Um, and then we have next gen kind of being adopted in a PA way. So we have all these instances and so it's making, very, making it very difficult for us to tag, let alone the conversation with ISKME as we're trying to upload these standards, which ones are we using? Um, so that has definitely been a challenge for us. Um, as stated before, we're trying to do something across a whole state. Every IU is different, all the districts are different. Um, and the other image of this guy is we've really um, had to work with folks in terms of the mind shift of OER. Um, and you know, we talk about in our training, OER has been around 15 plus years, but for the most people, uh, people were using it as a use level, reuse. Um, and so a big part of our training and the whole reason we went through that four part series is to make sure we go through the entire cycle of and get to the fifth R of redistribute. And um, that's the hardest part, right? And that's the hardest part when they leave how are we going to make sure that they keep doing the entire cycle and not just reuse or remix? Um, so that's always going to be an issue. But um, I think Kevin's on not with us. Um, many of our districts hear about OER in district administration, and it tells you this large number of how much money you're going to save. And we really try not to emphasize that. Um, there could be some savings, but we really talk about the shifting of your money to go towards your teachers and their time, pulling them out to work collaboratively together on OER. And, um, you know, now the time is given to your teachers. So you might not be purchasing a, test, a textbook, but you need time for your teachers to develop, to curate, to author, and to evaluate these resources and align them to the curriculum. So that um, is a big a bit of a mind shift for some of the districts we work with and um, we're doing what we can to help them move towards that. And then um, depending on our area, just getting it buy-in from districts. Some districts are like, why do we need to know this? Or what is OER? Or they're just at different places. And depending on what part of the state, um, you know, they're just at different levels. Um, Kevin, I believe, is online. His um, IU is in the western part of the state. He's probably the first one in the IUs who started professional learning before we even started this work. They did go full, go open, 
and did a lot of work with them. And so they were totally a different spot than our IU. We were saying people are hearing about it, but they, they need some guidance with it. So we went that route. Um, we have another IU who hasn't done any of the professional learning yet. They're just focusing on the curating. So there is stuff in their, their group before they take people to professional learning. And so that speaks to, again, that flexibility um, among the IUs, but that could be a challenge uh, sometimes as well. And Anne, um, Kevin shared a comment in chat, and Kevin, you're welcome to chime in too. Um, but he, he just shared that the best success stories about OER adoption are about how districts use money that used to go out the door to publishers and instead was applied to PD in time for course development. Yes, so absolutely. Reiterating your point there and something we hear, hear a lot. Um, Cause I think a lot of people tend to lead with the cost savings with, which is great, but um, it's such an opportunity to really invest in your, in your talent and expertise um, that you have with your, with your community. Definitely. So a lot of that was kind of our during, and now we're, we're moving to our A or after part, um, which is what we're starting to work on or what's coming up. So I just put two um, instances here for you to see. Um, it just so happened. I mean, every once in a while the stars align and that's worked for two things for us. So one, um, we have a very, very strong STEM initiative happening in our state right now. And so one of the statement of work areas was a STEM learning toolkit was to be developed. And so that's our meeting of trainers today. We have some STEM point of contacts here um, and the lead STEM point of contact for the state. And if we're building this STEM learning toolkit, why in the world, why wouldn't we put it in OER, in the OER Commons in our PIU hub? So in order to do that, we have to train those STEM points of contact so they have enough knowledge about OER to then um, train others and bring educators together to author materials and to curate materials that are aligned to Pennsylvania. So we're excited, we're just starting that work um, and we're pretty excited about that happening again, good timing. The other um, great timing was with one of our IUs, it's IU8, Appalachia Intermediate Unit there. And they had received a grant from our Department of Ed in the area of customized learning. So they're uh, working a lot with Mass Customized Learning, MCL, and they had done work over the summer to build these lessons. And at the same time, they were hearing about, hey, we're, we're creating this hub that you'll be able to put lessons and things. So again, stars aligned, and they were able to put all of those lessons, um, and they are all similar in nature. So if you look at a, um, IU8's um, area, you will see resources that are structured, their lessons all around the 5E model, um, again, focusing on customized learning. And um, they have, I think they're up to about 200 resources, and they've all been authored by teachers in Pennsylvania. So again, that was a separate grant. And it just happened to fit the timing of when we kicked off our hub um, and they were able to put that in there. So that IU is really focusing on curating and authoring at the moment. They are getting ready to push out their training now that they have stuff actually in their group. So a different approach from an IU, but very exciting to pull together different initiatives, different projects that are happening. Um, so it's making sure that OER is seamless and not something on the side that, oh, it's yet another thing to do. We're trying to, to marry it with as many things as we possibly can. So um, we bring us back to the cycle. I, you heard me say cycle several times, I think, but um, these were our four areas again that we actually trained in our professional learning. We started with the overview and the planning. We went in to curate and evaluate. Then we went to the instruct level. We asked folks to go back and actually implement. Um, and then we always come back, the importance of assessing and reflecting. Um, and then just starting that cycle over again. Um, so it's a continuous cycle. We're trying to embed it into everything we do. So it's not a standalone, like I said. Um, and one of our goals will be, especially after like 
our districts have finished all four days of the training. How can we continue this cycle in their districts? And how can we continue that at our IU? Um, because we all know the power of collaborative work um, to create the best product. Um, so that's our kind of vision for continuing and not losing sight of all the work that we've done. And um, I'll just share there. We have this on a lot of our groups um, within our, our hub, our kind of our focus area. And um, like I said, that helps us um, focus on our districts and region and how do we just keep that cycle going and how do we make sure that um, these districts and us as intermediate units um, make sure we get to the fifth R of redistributing and give back to the OER community. Um, we um, had two examples today that people had attended a conference or had met with a district who said, yes, we're an OER district, we've done X, Y, and Z. And they show you all this great stuff and then you say, oh, well, where can I get that? Um, what can I do with that? What's, you know, what license have you given it? And they said, oh, no, we're not sharing it. Then we're like, what? <laughs> You know, it just kind of shocks us still, even though it probably shouldn't shock us, but there's still that mentality of, oh, I paid my teachers time and money to work on this work. And so we went to a resource to, to design all this, but we're not giving it back to the OER community. And then we have to have a conversation. Well, that's not really open, right? And so that's a challenge, a continuous struggle. And we wanna make sure that our districts and our regions are doing that fifth R and redistributing and giving back to the OER community. So that's definitely an area that we will continuously uh, try to emphasize with our districts. Okay, so I will breathe a little and uh, see if we have some, some questions. Yes, yes, please breathe. Everyone, take a breath. <laughs> Um, wow, thank you so much, Anne. It's, it's just so, so great to hear about your journey. Um, and thank you so much for calling out the, the sharing back to the community. And it's, that's not always, I think most people's kind of workflow is like, oh, what can I get and what can I curate? And they're excited about that. But it is a, a different level of, of engagement and participation when you're actually contributing to the community. So thanks for calling that out. And it's, it's interesting to hear how people feel about that because that does take time and people have a lot of different feelings about, you know, sharing things like, you know, maybe it's not ready or, um, but we kind of always take the, the, um, the philosophy that um, some of our friends that, that work at um, Mountain Heights Academy in Utah always say like, don't be afraid to publish your first draft. That that's the whole kind of, um, you know, spirit of open is that you can continue to iterate and change and remix. Um, but, you know, putting it out there is a value to the community. So, so thanks for, for calling that out. Yeah. Um, and it's funny that you said that because one of our districts, um, actually we have Maryland one, I believe they had found some of the work that Howard County had done in OER Commons for professional learning and they remixed that and they basically created kind of an online course to send to their staff. And um, we were having a little bit of trouble. Um, we didn't realize before you publish, the title still reflects the previous owner. And so they were concerned about that. And so we were trying to figure that out. And so we had uh, come to ISKME to try to resolve that. And so ISKME published it. And so this district, it was an assistant superintendent and he was a little nervous. He's like, I didn't give attribution yet. Like mm -hmm. he goes, it's not ready. And um, not knowing that once you hit publish, the title did fix itself and attribution was automatic within um, OER commons, which was really nice. I think he still put something um, in his uh, writing as well, but um, he was so nervous that it had been put out there. Um, before everyone could see it. So yeah. um, that's definitely true. And we work with the districts and the teachers to remind them that you can go back in there and make a change and update. So it's okay that it's not a perfect polished item that's out there. Right. Yeah. And it can, I mean, you know, not, maybe not everybody has done a lot of, you know, 
work with open licensing or publishing and so it can feel intimidating and that's why in our authoring tools we try to make that as seamless as possible so that when you re remix something it it immediately gives attribution to whoever was the original author but that was great to see Howard County in, in Virginia's um, work uh, translate over to to Pennsylvania that's wonderful yeah and I forgot to mention oh. sorry at the beginning so last session in the OER um, storytelling series was with Evan Abbey and um, he you know, really their hub was the first education service agency we saw there. So he and I actually connected. He was so open to help us and share his successes and challenges with us so we could say make some decisions to move forward in Pennsylvania. So when we did this series, we, we said, you know, make sure Evan goes first before us because he really um, started the pathway and we kind of used them as a model to um, move forward in Pennsylvania. That's great. And, and Evan had also mentioned how you're collaborating with Nebraska and are open to other states as well that are, um, you know, kind of service agencies that are in these similar, um, similar kind of times uh, in terms of OER implementation, um, which is, which is great. Um, and, and feel free folks to uh, ask any questions I have I have a bunch but I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to I don't I can talk to Anne anytime this is this is special time for you all but we did have um, a question from Deb um, Vale who um, was curious and actually well she she doesn't work directly with Evan but she, they're in the same building in Iowa mm -hmm. um, if uh, you could make your pr um, presentation available later uh, Absolutely. I actually do have a <laughs> currently a Google uh, shortener for it, even though that's going away. Um, I do have that set up. It will still work. So no fear there. Um, so I'll make sure I share that with um, with you, uh, Megan. So when you send out the recording, that can be included with it. OK, wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. I, was, I was curious. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting to see kind of the different levels of and paths of how statewide impact really happens. And I don't, I don't believe Pennsylvania has o OER policy in, in place statewide yet. Have you all have any conversations around that? I know, um, like other states like Washington does, you know, have have policy in place. And, and so that's, you know, just kind of the new standard, um, which has definitely helped in some ways. Um, have, have you all have had any conversations in terms of Pennsylvania legislation or policy or, you know, some more structure in terms of like what the expectations are for IUs and, you know, what they're creating and sharing? Um, I'm just, I'm just curious because I know yeah. a lot of other states are grappling with that. It's really interesting. As I said, this was a grassroots um, approach and something I didn't mention. I think it's the same in Iowa. We don't have a department of ed tech at our department of education. Um, so we don't have, you know, a director at the state level. Um, many states do. Um, so uh, often our group sort of acts in loco parentis of that role. And so, um, but we're not at the Department of Ed, right? We, we don't, you know, work for them. Um, but we've built all of this and now um, we've met with the Department of Ed multiple times. So we have a, a SAS, we, it's called the PDE SAS portal, which is where all of our standards are, um, curriculum, instruction, um, and there are materials and resources in there, um, but it's been a difficult area to maintain and, and upkeep. So they're um, very interested in working with us now and combining those efforts. Um, and even the work we're doing today with STEM, actually that is um, a statement of work from the Department of Ed for STEM. So now we're starting to, to mingle the two. Um, and I even had some people from the Department of Ed today coming to the training so they could learn more about it. In terms of policies, if you look on the DMAPs, um, I think, I'm trying to remember, I think Pennsylvania, there might be something at the college level, but there's nothing at the K-12 level for Pennsylvania. Um, again, with local control, it gets, it gets difficult to mandate something like that. Like I believe Utah and Washington maybe can do that level. It's really hard for us to do something at that level. 
Um, but we are in conversations, um, and I think that will help us move forward. But we're definitely not at a policy level yet. Great. Um, we'll, we'll stay tuned on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Keep um, looking at the DMAPs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny. So I forget somebody from a state recently this week just was asking just for some language that other states have used. So I shared the Washington open policy just so they, they were like, we just want to see how they, you know, yeah. wrote it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're just trying to even get the DMAPs up to date um, currently to reflect this work in OER Commons. So I don't think that's been updated yet. I haven't looked at it in a few weeks, but at this point it was just pointing folks to our SAS system, which has some open content, but it's not all open. Um, so it just depends where you are in the materials and resources. Um, so we're working to get that updated to reflect, hey, we do actually have an open space. It's in OER Commons. It's called the PA, PAIU OER Hub. So um, I know the DMAPs are just being updated. Um, so we're hoping, I don't know if we made the cut for this most recent update, but we're hoping to get OER Commons and what we've done added to that area. So it does show that Pennsylvania is working with open, open ed resources. Great. Um, I, I see a question here from Kevin kind of to the larger uh, group too. Um, and feel free if you guys, I mean, we muted people's microphones just for feedback, but you're welcome to to chime in or, you know, use chat, communicate, however you feel most comfortable. But Kevin um, was curious to know if others on the webinar are finding that schools tend to think of OER as supplemental. So if anyone has any thoughts about that. Um, it's interesting in terms of like pathways and you talked about kind of the different routes, uh, the different IUs have taken in Pennsylvania. Um, sometimes for people, you know, the idea of adopting a full textbook or a full course is a little bit daunting. So sometimes it's a way for them to kind of dip their toe in the water and say, well, you know, let's see if we can find something for your, you know, unit um, on, you know, ecology or um, so we, in, in, in my experience, we see a lot of uh, different pathways. Um, and I think a lot of it just kind of tends on tends to focus on like the, the motivation and what the goals are. Um, if people really do want full adoption, uh, sometimes they just jump right in and other times it's it's a little bit more of an easing into <laughs> what can I, let's see, what, what can I use, you know, for, for the rest of the school year, we have, you know, two months left, what, what's something that that I can test out and see how it works, but I'm curious what, what others have found. And Kevin, if you want to share any of your experience as well, feel free to, to, to let us know. Hi, this is Kevin. Um, yeah, especially this year, I felt that um, the districts who joined our group, you know, looking at OER, tended to be much more um, hesitant and they really looked at how can we just supplement things rather than. Now I did have two districts that are doing a complete swap. Um, they are abandoning their traditional textbook and they're building a course uh, as we speak. Uh, the good thing is they're taking advantage of their LMS and then incorporating CK-12 as, you know, the, in quotes, textbook. So that's pretty exciting. And they're really diligent. They are, they are truly down to changing words in, inside the chapters and everything to make it completely match. Um, the standards and where they think it's, you know, the way they would teach it. That's awesome. I, it made me think, Kevin, we had a teacher, I think she found an OpenStax book um, for sociology. And um, one thing she said she had trouble finding um, were supplemental materials. You know, it was, it was kind of just a digital textbook um, without 
activities and, and interactives. So what she did is she said, okay, well, I'm going to develop those. So she came to our four part series. And so she authored um, lessons to support the text that she found in OpenStax and she made interactives and activities for the kids and she's published those back into OER Commons. So it was great because it was a subject area that's not too often you know, looked at and she was worried if she'd even be able to find anything. And she was so excited to find the OpenStax book, but she knew in order to make it even more effective, she needed to design um, activities to support it. So she basically created the supplementals and then gave them back to the community. That's great. It's it's so exciting to see that too, because that's such a different um, experience, you know, level of engagement and experience when the people are really thinking deeply around the the remixing and and you know down to the word. I I, I love that. That's mm -hmm. that's really inspiring. Um, I'm curious, you know, um, if there's any kind of quality criteria that you as the intermediate units kind of um, put out there, or is that just kind of something that comes naturally from conversations around curation? Um, I know some, some, um, you know, especially leveraging different initiatives, like, you know, do you want things that have, you know, a real tech integration or really strong STEM or, you know, different teaching styles and things like that? Have there been some uh, conversations around quality criteria for for using OER or is that just kind of a personal preference for, yeah. for the involved? So one of the main reasons we ended up choosing OER Commons because we definitely did our work and looked at different repositories and systems out there but one of the main reasons we kept coming back to OER Commons is the fact that the Achieve rubrics were embedded and it was rather interesting from IIU probably three or four years ago we had done an entire series um, called It's My School kind of personalized learning approach and we were talking about assessing digital content. And at that time, we had taken them to the Achieve rubrics. They were separate at that time, as far as I know. Um, and so here we are several years later, and we're, we kept coming back to OER Commons from multiple areas. And when we saw the Achieve rubrics embedded and the Equip rubrics, we were like, this is, this is perfect. This is what we need. So um, in our trainings, we spend time I'm doing that. We make it very uh, well known that on a teacher daily basis, they're not going to go to those rubrics. Um, in the meantime, they might use kind of the Amazon style star quality rating for resources they find. Um, but when we're bringing working groups together like today um, and in our professional learning series, we are taking time to use those achieve rubrics and equip rubrics. Um, to help with that vetting and that quality piece. Um, interestingly enough too, like the work we're doing today with STEM, um, they are, we've had this conversation and I've been working with several colleagues of aligning to the standards and then using the Achieve rubrics. And we're going through even the digital collections that have been curated um, by ISKME, such as the NGSS uh, collection. Um, we're going through that and aligning it to PA now, and we're evaluating those for teachers. So that's a lot of the work we're doing today. But we're talking about even the authoring level of this group, which will be coming down the road. Those eventually will probably have a stricter uh, vetting process. And so we're hoping to pull those types of things up to the digital collection level that would be PA created. Um, for now, within a school district, within the IU, you know, you have the rubrics and you have different levels of implementation of those rubrics. So there's not as, um, you know, strict of a level. And we, we want to be careful not to create too many uh, roadblocks for people in that area too. But we see like a lot of materials living in those areas. And then the materials that are geared towards a very specific initiative or funding or statewide activity will have a maybe different level of vetting and we'll push them up to the digital collection level. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone knows what that 
area is, um, who's on the call with us today, and I can go live if you want, but we have collections out of OER Commons, I believe, Megan can correct me, over 200. We've narrowed it down to about 25 collections, and so they're kind of at the top level of our site. And so we see creating, um, through a, a stricter vetting process, resources to go up to the digital collection level versus in our individual group areas. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So there's like this kind of workflow to feed into to your to your collections. Um, and we've actually seen um, quite a few states inspired by yourselves in Iowa adopting this as well. And even wanting to kind of like prune collections is, is one term that folks use to really make it super relevant. So there was one use case where it was um, one of our agriculture collections and they wanted something that was specifically um, more resources that were specific to their regional location as opposed to, you know, something that was created here in California wouldn't be as relevant for, for Pennsylvania per se. But um, that's where you know the kind of flexibility and personalization of OER comes into play. Um, I know we only have a few minutes left, um, and I want to just give folks one more you know one more call out for for any questions you can share in chat or or chime in. Um, but one thing that strikes me about your state that's really interesting, Anne, is that there's such an array of communities within Pennsylvania. You have you know very urban, um, you know, cities and, um, you know, very rural communities as well um, and kind of everything in between. Um, and for other states that, you know, have kind of a, a similar, uh, it, it can be seen as a challenge to kind of, you know, connect with all these different uh, diverse uh, communities. Do you have any recommendations, especially, you know, in terms of organizing the trainings and getting people on board in terms of like what has been successful in connecting with with such a such a diverse array of of communities within your state? Um, yeah, I would definitely say um, that flexibility that we built into the, all of this. You know, um, from the training standpoint, um, again, some IU up north might not be ready for this. You know, so that four part series is they're not quite ready for that. So the ability to change. Um, the training to make it their own and address the needs of their districts has been really important in all of the training. Um, and we've built that from the ground up with that intent, which I think was extremely important. Um, you know, sometimes we have statewide things that come out. It's kind of canned and okay, everyone do this. This is definitely not that. This was built with the intention of we will come together as our project team of nine members and build for kind of the general um, area and then each IU can take it and make it their own. So um, definitely to meet the diverse needs across the state, that has been really important. That's great. And I'm just curious, what's next? Like what, so you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're continuing the STEM work and I think it's really interesting. Um, you had said earlier about kind of the textbook versus supplemental. Um, so today when I was helping the group that was um, evaluating and vetting from the NGS collections, um, you know, we were trying to pick and choose different things. So we found a simulation, which was pretty easy to align versus an entire unit, which took us forever to align. It was multidisciplinary, which is interdisciplinary, which is what we wanted, but getting the standards for English, math, science, was a little more challenging. Um, so we um, are continuing that STEM work definitely and that's going to eventually connect to our statewide um, curriculum standards site um, with the Department of Ed. Um, and then a lot of IUs haven't started their professional learning yet. So they're getting ready to start theirs or they're planning for the fall. Other IUs are still curating and then what's really exciting for us is I use, as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of different job alikes. And one of the reasons this was exciting is it wasn't just um, ed tech doing this. And I, I for, feel sorry I didn't mention at the very beginning, the, the project team consists of members of the ed tech um, 
statewide group as well as the curriculum statewide group. So it's often hard to get those two groups to work on things together because of timing, because of X, Y, and Z. And so this was a true um, project from both areas. But our next steps is we'll be able to connect. I already have a few IUs who are working with their adult ed job alike um, directors. Obviously, we'll be able to do this with our special ed directors. Um, we have Act 89, which is our non-pub schools. So we're excited that this is something that can go across many areas of an IU and not just curriculum and ed tech. Um, that was a win in itself, but now we're ready to broaden to those other groups, which is really exciting. That's great. And we're, we're coming up on the hour, but oh my gosh, Kevin just added a, an awesome comment that um, I'd, I'd love to, if, Kevin, if you want to expand or, or Anne, if you want to say anything um, about this, just how OER can be uh, motivating to disadvantaged districts as a way of achieving equity, since those resources are open and free for all. Um, I, we're hearing more and more conversations around how OER is meeting different equity needs, not only around access, but also just relevancy and inclusion and, and diversity of, you know, materials um, and, you know, who's represented in those materials. Um, any thoughts and final thoughts on equity or Kevin, if you want to chime in too, it's, um, it's an important part of the conversation that I'm sorry, we don't have more time for, but any, anything you want to say around equity, Anne or Kevin? I was giving a little wait time for Kevin. I'm not sure <laughs> if he's joining or not, but I would say, um, I think one of our STEM, um, part of the STEM beliefs is equity as well. So I think that aligns perfectly with what we're doing there. But um, we talk about that with our districts in our training as well. Um, and it definitely with the diversity in our state, um, that is an important piece. Um, and, you know, we talk about diversity in the sense of access at home versus school. And one of the great things is, you know, not everything means, you know, even in a one-to-one -one environment that it needs to be technology. Um, but there are resources that are things that you can print or use. And so no matter what level a district is, they're bound to find some resources that can apply to them. Or if not, remix, make it their own and um, try it out in their district and to meet their needs. Um, that's been really essential for all of our districts. And we have a very diverse group in our IU as well. That's great. Yeah, the real personalization of, of OER and, and the thoughtfulness around the equity needs is, is a real great opportunity for, for um, OER to support some of those, some of those uh, needs and priorities. Um, I could talk about equity all day. Um, that's awesome. Thank you so much. I, I don't want to keep folks late, but I just want to um, say just again, um, thank you so much, Anne um, and Kevin for joining as well. It was great to have your perspective and, and thanks for uh, your, your great questions uh, that you shared. I'm so, I'm so thrilled that everybody was able to join today and just want to let you know that we have two more um, speakers in this series next up on Tuesday April 24th at 2 p.m. Pacific time we have Bu Young Che who is a policy associate of e-learning and open education at Washington State Board of Community and Technical Colleges um, so she'll be speaking from the research and policy point of view uh, they you know, certainly from the community college uh, perspective, but um, also she's, you know, collaborating with K-12 as well. So really interesting perspective there um, and what's happening in Washington. And then our final speaker is Erica Zimmer, who is a technology integrationalist and instructional designer in Vermont, who is a uh, uh, kind of tackling some of the same things that, that you all are doing, but in a virtual way uh, to support uh, OER uh, training and adoption uh, in Vermont, but really um, from a virtual perspective, which is, which is interesting to see, um, you know, how these different states are, are supporting uh, educators throughout. So, and that's on Tuesday, May 8th at noon Pacific time. 
Um, but we are recording all of these. So if you can't make any of them, um, I send out uh, usually um, within 24 hours mm -hmm. of, of, the, uh, of the session, we send out the recording so you can watch it on your own time. Um, and if you have any suggestions of people that we might want to showcase, well, there's been a lot of interest and, um, you know, people have really enjoyed this series. We've received some great feedback, so um, we'd like to continue it. So if you maybe want to be a part of our next series or, or want to nominate somebody, uh, please feel free to do so. And um, just uh, looking forward to hearing the rest of these stories and hope it was informative for you all and um just thanks again everyone for for joining us and uh i'll be following up with the recording of this session uh shortly so thanks everybody and uh we will be in touch thank you megan again for asking us to share we greatly appreciated it absolutely thanks ann and please reach out if you have any questions from us. Um, I had on the last slide contact info, and this link should get you to our slides. Thanks for joining us. Great. Thanks, Anne. Bye.